It's funny you mentioned Darwin because last week I was actually at the Galapagos Islands where Darwin carried out a lot of his studies and, and there of course there are some very strange creatures that appear nowhere else and I think looking to the future you have to think in a bit of a strange way um, not small changes and small very slow evolutionary changes to humans that we might have witnessed in the past but large leaps, technological changes um, and hence when it comes to human evolution I, I think we're going to see very very different entities um, than we presently regard as humans. I, I, certainly you regard them as transhuman or posthuman but they'll be very different. Realistically, we can see we, we don't need our physical bodies anymore. Our physical bodies are just there for carrying our brains around, and it's creating enormous problems in certain parts of the world. We see large sections of the world with obesity, and people spending, in, in other, say, spending two or three hours a day exercising just to keep their body going. Why? What a waste of time. What do we need our physical bodies? Well, our physical bodies are really there to carry our brains around. It's our intellect that is important. And I feel what we are going to see within the next 50 to 100 years is doing away with our physical bodies. We don't need it. We, we can have much better physical capabilities. I've just flown here in an aeroplane to, to Amsterdam, which is where we are, just across the sea. Humans can't naturally fly. The technology is much better, and we use that. What, why be limited with our physical body? So even we can look at intelligence, but even on the physical side of things, I think we're going to see an enormous transition. Within the, the number of questions in this area, I, I, I don't know the number of questions, they're probably in lots of areas, but in this particular area, they are increasing at an exponential rate. I think what we've discovered is a, a new continent, uh, the, the possibility of humans evolving technically, biotechnically maybe, uh, and that opens up enormous questions. What's life going to be like technically what we can do? Uh, so it is like we've just discovered North America, and. Where are we going to do? What are we going to go? What, what, what happens here? There are strange people there. Um, so I think for some people that they can perhaps be a bit scared of that and uh, there's a bit of a backlash not want to go ahead for it where there are others, pioneers, who find it tremendously exciting. So I see it as a very positive thing, but not everybody might do so. Um. There are people who maintain that science is neutral, that technology is neutral, and that it is only its applications that become a force for good or, or, or for evil. Mm. And I very much disagree. Uh, because scientists are humans, uh, engineers and those who implement these technologies are humans, mm. and it has never been the case that scientists or engineers didn't ask themselves questions about morality, questions about ethics. Yeah. Um, in the times of uh, the uh, Manhattan Project, uh, Oppenheimer sure. and Fermi were very much aware of what were the possible negative applications oh, of what I, they I have were to doing. say Albert Einstein too. And uh, there are some people that have said, oh, Albert oh, Einstein yeah, was, um, af after things oh, occurred, he oh, wished he hadn't have come up with his equations yeah. and so on. He was a very clever guy. He knew damn well what he was doing. Um, and he knew there were positives, negatives and so on, but he went ahead with it. And, and hence I feel if Albert Einstein could, you know, then as a research scientist, this is what you're about. It is a little bit unknown though. You, you don't know where the applications are going to be biased to take it. But I, I think as a research scientist, it's my job to open the box and see what's possible. Even though I know, sometimes it could be used for good, sometimes it could be used for bad. So I, I think we're always going to come against tinkering is great, you know, get into it by, by tinkering. And uh, in, in a sense, tinkering and mathematics can go hand in hand, but 
as with people like Michael Faraday, you don't need to be heavily steeped in the mathematics and the equations to have a bit of a tinker. I think a lot of science has been done by experimentation, finding out by experimentation and feeling for yourself. And, and this is very much in vogue now that you can do that with stem cells, as you said. I mean, that they could have a profound effect as far as Alzheimer's disease, just one problem. This is a, a rapidly increasing disease, a rapidly increasing problem, simply because there are many more older people than there used to be. So I think as a scientist you have to listen to what society says. Uh, when it, it has a voice, um, I think when it comes to upgrading, for example, let us say we have new senses, we, want, we both want an infrared sense, Fine, let's go and get it. Then society tends to be a bit quiet because it doesn't know what that might mean. There's a little bit of, well, should you have a sense and I don't have that sense, which is probably right, but it doesn't shout and say, no, you can't do that. Now, if we wanted to carry out an experiment now, maybe on camera, both having an infrared sense, a new sense, Technically, we can go and do it, we can try it and we can see. Ethically, it would not be too difficult to actually get that bit of approval in order to do that. But there's not, society doesn't really understand what it means. Whereas with tracking children and putting an implant in somebody's daughter or son, it does understand that. So I think even society as a voice can raise concerns and we have to listen to them. But a worry is that there are issues that we're pushing back the frontiers and we can't really rely on society's voice there because society doesn't really understand what the positives and negatives might be. What I'm looking at modification, upgrading, is in the sense of plugging into the brain to upgrade with artificial intelligence and so on. Now, from the experiments that we've already done, it seems that some sensory input, I've had an ultrasonic sense as a new sense. Fine, my brain was able to cope with that. It, I'd say it was a linear change. It was a little bit, it had to learn over six weeks, but no big deal. And it worked great. I was able to detect objects with a blindfold on and fine, as, as you can with an ultrasonic sense. I would think something like an infrared sense, it's a heat signal, probably our brains would be able to adapt to that. When we start pushing it a little bit, an X-ray sense, for example, not X-ray in a vision, not saying converting it to our normal senses, and looking here at feeding it in as a new sense. That's quite a change. It's, it's quite a, a non-linear jump. Yeah, an so, example that comes into my mind could be perceiving a vector field. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A scalar oh, field. As I would say, multi-dimensional thought. I mean, this is one of the big, big advantages of machine intelligence. If we compare machine intelligence and human intelligence, as a human, you are so stuck thinking in two dimensions or three dimensions at most. And you can see computers dealing with 10, 20 dimensions. Wow, wow, wow. That might, that, that transition, if I plug a computer in just that thing, suddenly I can start thinking in 4D. What does it mean? It's very, very difficult for people to conceive. Some people, when you discuss with them and say, yeah, you can start thinking about things in four or five dimensions. No, no, everything is three dimensional. They're stuck in the way that humans think because they've been thinking that way all their life. It has to be three dimensional because that's how I perceive it. I cannot possibly perceive it in another way. But if I can, with a 4D input by my brain, Maybe it would be traumatic, maybe it would be, uh, but we don't know. The only way we're going to find out, plug it in and see what happens. So, <laughs> Thank you, David. Thanks, Kevin. It was very nice. <laughs>